Bill Hurd from Hackaday. We're continuing the series on from gates to FPGAs. Last time we talked about basic logic. We showed some of the symbols, an introduction to uh, logic equations. I got a lot of feedback by, of, on the fact that I jump around when I use them. Sorry, used many over the years, right? So today we're going to talk about some of the electrical properties. I'm mostly about DC. We're not talking about the speeds just yet, uh, but the voltages we use when we uh, deal with logic. And... Uh, it's gotten more complicated. But we're going to talk about the technologies and the families that uh, help us define what voltage is what. And it'll also tell us a little bit about noise and that kind of thing on these lines. So let's get started talking about basic logic. I've pulled out my old TTL book. When, if, who uses a data book these days? Hey, mine's hardbound and you can't have it. It's mine. So let's get started with basic logic and TTL. As I mentioned today, we're talking about basic logic, the electrical properties, and by that I mean the voltages of a high and a low. You know, you make a certain voltage and we call it a low, you make a certain voltage and we call it a high. It's actually all analog, but we're going to, we'll get to that. Uh, what we're not talking about today is differential, where there's a push-pulling effect, which we do for high-speed lines, where we use a pair of signals for each, each signal, or a pair of wires, conductors, for each signal. We are doing single-ended, where there's a signal that goes high for a true and low for, for a false or a zero. Uh, we're not talking about the I.O. lines in microprocessors and peripherals today. Uh, the, this is strictly the, 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 the gates function. We'll, we'll get to I.O. lines when we talk about processors more anything. So we're going to start by talking about TTL, as I mentioned. And uh, before we talk about TTL, we've got to talk about where it came from. There is a major division in the technologies that I will talk about. I'm not talking about ECL today. I'm talking about TTL, which means transistors, but it also means that the... the uh, the precautions, the, the voltage ratings, the voltage levels that go along with anything that came from the TTL line of, of, of chips, of, of circuits. And then there's CMOS, complementary metal oxide semiconductor. It's a, I don't want to call it a different religion, but it's a different technology and it's got its own things. It's like the ESD protections and latch ups, but then as they got better they could do things that the transistor, the regular bipolar transistor logic could not do. So I'm going to start talking on that as far as those two families. I'm going to start talking by TTL. And before we talk about TTL, I'm going to talk about RTL and DTL. So let's take a look at what those are and I'll explain them. All right, starting with the immediate predecessors to TTL was RTL, resistor transistor logic, where inputs were through resistors into a transistor, RT. Uh, and if this looks like an analog circuit, well, remember I said that it's all analog. We choose to call certain voltages a zero and we choose to call certain voltages a one. And it's the circuitry's job to get better and better at only making lows and high voltages and not hang around in the middle, I'll tell you. Well, as you can tell with the resistor, it's easy to make the voltages in the middle. We end up with resistor dividers. So there's a limit to what RTL will, will do. So the next step was diode transistor logic, DTL. And here a diode is a switch, as you may remember. It's either on or off. And when it's off, it's pretty off. Uh, and so we can couple several of these together and get better performance. A resistor is never on or off. It's just summing currents, right? Well, that's, this is a switch. Diode transistor logic. Uh, still has limitations. We need the resistor to supply the current to the diode. Still pretty analogish. Finally, TTL, transistor transistor logic. No, I'm not stuttering. It means that we use transistors to switch and we use transistors to drive. And uh, in this case, you see uh, the transistor even does something kind of strange. It's called a multiple emitter transistor. I haven't seen these, uh, you know, outside of chips. Um, you can certainly package one up as a discrete part. Uh, but they do it inside a chip because they can. It's all just layout, and in this case, they've created a, uh, an, an ANDing function that becomes a NAND function. So TTL, transistor, transistor logic. So here's, that, here's the full circuit for what we were just looking at. And this is a NAND gate like in a 7400. And so we see that we have an AND function. Both these need to be high, low, high, low. And here starts the properties of, our, uh, of TTL which is when this transistor is on, its output voltage is, you know, regular transistor, silicon transistors, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5 volts. Um, 
which is less than a silicon diode. Well, that's what a transistor does when it turns on. It's actually a little bit magic. It, it makes a voltage drop less than the diodes that are inside of it. Um, so pretty good at sinking current down. To make the voltage go high, however, um, we've, we've got a voltage drop of a diode or 1.6. We've got another, you know, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5. So we're up to our volt. And then we even have a resistor. So when the voltage is coming from here out to the load, it's minimal. The TTL started at 400 microamps. Let's talk about what TTL compatible voltages mean. And TTL compatible means that the first TTL chips used a, a voltage for a high and a voltage for a low. And they have basically stuck with it if you want to be compatible uh, year after year as the new chips came out. There are two sets of voltages. An output of a TTL gate has an output voltage output high of 2.4, which means it'll make at least 2.4 volts. And it has a voltage output low of 0.5, meaning that it will be below, at least below 0.5 volts. Um, the input has two other voltages, similar but different. Voltage input high of 2 volts, voltage input low of 0.8 volts. So what that means is we're going to make, like, if we make a square wave, it will be at least as low, at least as high, and at least as low. That's on the output. On the input, we're looking for a square wave to be at least these two voltages. So it's smaller. Well, what happens? Why is that smaller? Well, that we could be losing some voltage in things like uh, the IR drop of the lines, not often. Uh, it, there could be uh, due to the load, how many things we've got on it, but a lot of times it's due to noise. And so this is called the noise margin. This gives us room to have noise writing the high and the low. So this is our TTL compatible voltages. Nowadays we have TTL comes in multiple voltages. In the old days it was just 5 volts. We have voltages of just 3 volts, 3.3. Um, these voltages remain the same. What happens is the amount of, of room up here at the top. In the old days, we, we'd we make 2.4 2 to 3 volts, and we had to kill 2 volts by basically dissipating as heat. These days, 3 volts less to dissipate. However, there's less headroom in here. Um, so they both, both voltages use the same TTL compatible voltages. Does this mean you can hook a 3 volt to a 5 volt without being careful? No. If, if this happens to make over 3 volts, the output of a 5 volt circuit happens to make more than 3 volts, 3.3 volts for the input circuit, you can damage this circuit if this is a 3 volt circuit here. So we need a, if you're going to do 5 volt to 3 volt, you need a higher voltage tolerant part, and we're going to talk about that later. Talking about just TTL and digital signals as 4 voltages is, uh, it's nice, but it's an oversimplification. Uh, I want to show you some real world. In this case, it's a simulated real world. Uh, I have a function generator built into my scope, but I've drawn what I've seen many, many times. And that is, uh, this is what a signal may look like um, over, you know, when there's repetition, lots of signals, bang, 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 bang. And they have different characteristics depending on how they were generated. And even though you're looking at just one trace, um, the logic that got there could, could do several things. So here we see a square wave, sort of that's got issues, uh, well, not issues, real life things. It's got uh, undershoots, it's got a reflection halfway up the top. There's some overshoot if you look here in the, uh, uh, in, in the ghosting images. And a lot of times with scopes, that's what all you'll see is like some ghosts if it's happening one out of a hundred times. I've colorized this, uh, hopefully you'll see it a little better. Uh, certainly in real life, uh, it's easier to see. But if you remember these thresholds, voltage input low, voltage input high, suddenly, what do you think when that voltage input low is seeing this kind of thing going on here? Um, or voltage input high if there's a reflection right in the middle of it acquiring the signal. Uh, so I wanted to show that uh, it's, it's not a clean thing and that the way we look at these circuits has to take into account if, if, for example, if this rings at the top and it actually falls out of the threshold input high, this, it starts over. Right, you you fell out of the threshold, and this this is normal. This happens all the time. Just wanted to show you some real life. Before I do a, a final summary of the bipolar TTL families that we've been talking about, I want to talk about what a Schottky family is. I'm sure you've heard of that. Well, a Schottky family uh, addresses a problem that they had in the early uh, TTL devices, which was the transistors once turned on would turn on and then some. They would saturate. All these charge carriers would. Uh, build up 
and before you could turn the transistor back off you'd have to drain off those charge extra excessive charge carriers kind of like when you go fishing and you've got too much slack in the line you have to reel in the slack before you can reel in the fish so what they did was they uh, put a diode and it happens to be a shot key cut diode because we need the very low forward voltage drop uh, between the base and collector and this the transistor will turn on and then stop it won't just keep going into saturation They'll then redraw the symbol like this to represent the fact it's a Schottky uh, a paired device like this. And then a, uh, a, a, a whole gate made of these where all the transistors are kept out of saturation starts to enjoy some of the speed benefits. And then they do other things to uh, lower the power and do some other things. And that's where we get variations like low power Schottky. So let's take a look at the families uh, finally here. I want to talk very briefly about the different bipolar TTL families. I need to be brief or it'll get boring real fast. So, by the way, when you see a 54, that's just a mil spec version of a 74. So, we're talking about the 74s. Right here was the plain Jane uh, TTL, kind of right in the middle of the field for uh, is speed, which is in this direction, and power dissipation, which is in this direction. The, the most used part after that then really became the low power shot key. So, we, we ha had low power and reasonable speed, actually about the same speed as the TTL. And then on the opposite end, we had shot keys. And these things were noisy when you used them, but boy, did they get the job done. It was like a 40 pound bowling ball. Uh, but then the AS, advanced shot key and advanced low power shot key. Uh, and look, the ALS is a great part. What you don't see here was the fast family, uh, the F parts, which we called, uh, which were the Fairchild Advanced uh, Shot Key TTLs, and and they were also really good. They they had some different drive characteristics than the ALS, and sometimes a little less noise for the kind of things we were doing. I'm going to wrap it up there for this time. Uh, this has been more about the bipolar TTL, and so as we get into the lower voltages, then you know we've been talking about the five volt, but that the lower voltages, the 3.3, uses the same levels. Uh, but a lot of times these are what we call bi CMOS devices. So next time we'll talk about CMOS, uh, the different thresholds they use, and then we'll talk about the lower voltages and the benefits of CMOS. Uh, these days CMOS is pretty prevalent in almost everything we do with the logic. So uh, Bill Hurd from Hackaday, uh, we'll see you next time. We'll talk about CMOS. We'll finish up DC electrical characteristics, gates to FPGAs.